In this video, we're going to take a look at Sanity, which is a web challenge from the Amateur CTF 2023. The CTF actually finished two weeks ago, and I did make a write-up for this challenge, which I'll link in the description. But I didn't get time to make a video, and I thought while the site is still up and the challenge is kind of fresh in my mind, I would come back and make this video walkthrough. So the description says, check out this pace bin. It's a great way to store pieces of your Sanity between CTFs. And we've got a site to connect to, we've got the source code to download as well, so let's go and jump straight over to the website. So we have two text boxes here and a submit button. We can try and click on submit just to get an idea what the functionality is like. It asks us for a title, so we put that in. It asks us for a body, so we put that in as well. And whenever we put in all the required information, we go through to another page which has a kind of random looking URL and a report button. Maybe we try and decode this, it doesn't look like base64 or anything, but you could throw it into Cyberchef anyway. I'm going to open up that report link and it says successfully reported. So it looks like what we just entered is probably going to be displayed on this page, although it actually wasn't. Let's do F12 and try and find out why. We can go into the inspector. We can see that we had this title and in here we've got decode URI components. So we put in a string title. That was probably a confusing word to put there because the idea's title and it's decoding our text, which is also title. And then we've also got a paste function here as well. So there's some script in here. You could right click and view the source, but we've already got the source. So let's just go and take a look at the code. A lot of people will jump straight into the code when it's provided. And I do that sometimes as well, but I also think it can be good to just have a look at the functionality of the website so that whenever you read the code, everything fits into place a little better. And we don't have too much code here. We've got 65 lines on sane EJS and we've got 83 lines on index.js. There's a couple of approaches for analyzing the code whenever you're doing a CTF challenge like this. You could go and look in order of the functionality. So whenever we enter the text into those two boxes and click submit, what happens? What's the protocol from there? And then you can just trace it through and see what's going on. Another option, and I think this can be good depending on the size of the challenge, if you actually look for the end goal first. So if we go over to index.js, there's quite a lot of stuff in here that isn't really too important. Like, look at this, it's just making sure that the title is within a certain length, the same with the body, making sure you don't submit an empty body as we saw there. But we're interested in finding out where is the flag reference and we'll find it here. So whenever that report goes through, which we also saw, essentially you've got an admin or a bot or whatever here, which is gonna visit the local host. So this is where the report is gonna be. It's gonna set a cookie which has the flag in it. So the name of the cookie is flag and the value is the flag that we're trying to retrieve. And then it's going to view the report that we send it. So a very classic XSS, we want to steal the cookie belonging to the admin and that will be the flag. So that's it. We know what the goal is. We could have a look through the rest of this file, but there isn't really much else of interest. It's just standard code that's required for setting up the bots and the endpoints. So let's go back to the EJS file and see where our XSS is going to be. And it doesn't take long to find this. You can see that we've got an if statement down here, if debug.sanitize. And if this is true, then it's going to set the HTML in that paste option to be what we provided, but it's going to use the sanitizer to prevent cross-site scripting. However, if debug.sanitize isn't set to true, then it's going to do the same thing. It's going to set the inner HTML to be what we've pasted in there, but it's not going to use the sanitizer. So it's not actually going to make sure that there isn't any dangerous cross-site scripting. All right, so continuing to trace this back, where is debug.sanitize configured? And we can scroll up a bit. We'll see that there is a class debug with a read-only property of sanitize, which is set to true. So whenever this is constructed, whenever an object is instantiated from this class, it's going to set sanitize to be true and we want it to be false. So let's have a look. Where is it actually set? Where is that debug object set? It's right here. So we've got const debug is equal to object.assign and then it's creating a new debug object and it's going to say here either assign the debug object all of the properties from extension or set the properties to this. So basically it's checking if extension exists, if it's defined, then copy all of the properties from extension into a new object of debug type. So this is the type of object that's being created. 
and any properties which are in extension will be copied over to that object. If extension isn't defined, it'll just go with this default. So by default, it's just going to create a new debug object. So it's going to have this.sanitize is equal to true. And it's also going to have another value, report is equal to true. So we know the end goal is XSS, but it looks like we also need to exploit a prototype pollution vulnerability in order to get there. So if we can pollute the prototype by controlling this extension object, perhaps we can set sanitize to be false, so disable the sanitizer in some way. In order to do that, we need to control extension. So we'll double click that and see where is it defined. And it's up here, so it's set to null. But then it says if window.debug.extension is true or is defined, then it's going to make a request to debug.extension.toString. So basically, if this exists and contains a URL, it's going to fetch that URL and then it's going to save the response to this res variable. And then it's going to set extension to equal res.json. So if we can find a way to set the window.debug.extension to be equal to a URL, maybe point into one of our own servers, it's going to make a request out to that server. And whatever the server returns is going to be set as the extension object in JSON. So let's just imagine here that we have a URL and whenever a request is made to it, it returns a JSON object with, let's say, report true and sanitize false. And then it's going to set extension to that. And then extension is going to be used to instantiate this object debug. And then debug is going to be checked for that sanitize property down here. All right, hopefully that makes sense so far. I've just returned to the website. What I'm going to do here is click submit again. Let's go to our console and let's try and check in here. Notice that we've got some error actually. Can't access lexical declaration sanitizer before initialization. We'll talk about this shortly, but for now, let's just try and do window.debug.extension. It's not looking good for us because it isn't defined. So is there anywhere else in here? Can we search for extension and see if we got any other references where it could be set? But we don't. So that brings us on to our third vulnerability or the first vulnerability, depending on which order you're looking at. This is the first vulnerability that we'll need to exploit. And that is DOM clobbering. So I'm on Port Swigger's Web Security Academy and it says DOM clobbering is a technique in which you inject HTML into a page to manipulate the DOM and ultimately change the behavior of JavaScript on the page. DOM clobbering is particularly useful in cases where XSS is not possible, but you can control HTML on a page where the attributes ID or name are whitelisted by the HTML filter. The most common form of DOM clobbering uses an anchor technique to overwrite a global variable which is then used by the application in an unsafe way, such as generating a dynamic script URL. The term clobbering comes from the fact you're clobbering a global variable or property of an object and overwriting it with a DOM node or HTML collection instead. For example, you can use DOM objects to overwrite other JavaScript objects and exploit unsafe names, such as submit, to interfere with the form's actual submit function. So if we return to our code again, we'll notice that our pasted value is set into the HTML. So you've got set HTML here for paste. And if we go to our title, we've also got set HTML, decode URI component, and it takes our title. So it does go through the sanitizer, but that doesn't stop safe HTML from being injected. And if we demo this, let's go back to the page. Let me do, oh, <laughs> terrible. There we go, submit and we didn't get anything. So this is when we need to look into this error. Well, we should probably looked into it already. There was recently a challenge on integrity, which had prototype pollution and was looking at the sanitizer as well. And the instructions said it must work in Chrome. The reason being, this is basically not yet supported in Firefox, but if you go to about config, you can enable it. We can go here and search for sanitizer. And here you go, sanitizer enabled, you can set that to true. Close it down. If we refresh the page again, notice that we now have that title and it is in bold as well. So let's just review our attack plan one final time. We want to trigger an XSS in order to steal the admin's cookie, which contains the flag, but we're being prevented from doing that by this if debug.sanitize, then use the sanitizer. So we probably want to pollute the prototype to disable the sanitizer or set sanitize to false. And in order to do that, 
we also need to clobber the DOM because the only way that we can control what is assigned to this object is if window.debug.extension contains a URL pointing to a JSON object that we control. And in order to ensure that it does contain that, we need to clobber the DOM, i.e. we need to inject some HTML so that whenever we go to do window.debug, that this isn't undefined. DOM clobbering isn't something I have much experience with. So I had to go and read through a couple of articles just looking at hat tricks and Port Swigger's Web Security Academy. And I found this DOM C payload generator. So it gives you a clobbering target and a value to enter. And then it'll generate some potential payloads that we can try. So in this case, our target is debug.extension. And the clobbering value, I basically put in here the server. So well, I'll go and create this anyway. Let's go and do web up. So this is just going to create a simple Python HTTP server. It's just an alias I've got set up to do that. And then we can also do ngrok HTTP 80 to expose the local web server to the internet on this domain that it's just generated for me. So I can basically put in here and say, this is the value we want. This is the URL we want it to point to. Uh, take out the HTTP and then we'll click generate. And now it gives us some payloads that we can go and try. So it's going to inject this link tag of debug. So that's the ID is debug. And then it's also going to inject another one where the ID is debug and the name is extension. So it's debug.extension. And then it's also got this href property because it's going to do a fetch on whatever this value is set to. And we want it to do a fetch to our domain. So let's take a copy of it. Let's go back to our challenge page and just try and paste this in here and click on submit. And notice that we get this message. Let me see, did we actually get a connection? We didn't get a connection. And we have a message here saying, options for the sanitizer constructor are not yet supported. Please notice experimental behavior. So although we enabled the sanitizer, I think there are still some issues with it. So at this point, I moved over to Google Chrome, which does support the sanitizer API. So I just moved over to Google Chrome and I've pasted that exact same DOM clobber in payload that we just received. And I'm gonna click submit. And this time we get this message saying access to fetch at, and it's been blocked by the cause policy. So that looks pretty good. It looks like it tried to make the connection to our ngrok, unlike in Firefox. So let's go and check the server. Okay, so good news. We moved over to our local server. We did get a connection on ngrok, but we know that it's not actually gonna load the resources that we send. And we're not actually sending any JSON object anyway at the moment. So there's a few things that you can do here. Actually, what I did was setting up a node server, but I found out later that you can actually use ngrok with a flag to set the request header. So you can do ngrok and then you can do request header add, and then you just add the access control allow origin header. But that's not what I did. So I'm gonna actually launch this on 3000, which is gonna be where we set up our node server. And let me just do in here, app.js and I'll paste this in. So here we go, just a simple server which sets this header to set access control out origin so that it's not gonna cause any problems with the data. So let us save this and let's go and try it with our new ngrok address. At the moment, we're just sending back an empty object. So I'm gonna save this. We need to also run the server. Of course, we're only sending an empty object at the moment, but that's fine. I'm going to do node app.js. So it's listening on port 3000 and we're forwarding that through this ngrok server. I will show towards the end another way to do this, which I saw from the challenge creator. But for now, let's just do it the way that I solved it. All right, I'm back over in Chrome again. The only thing that I changed is the ngrok address. So hopefully if we click submit, we now get this test, which, okay, it looks good. But notice that we didn't get the report link this time. Let me go to our terminal and let's do window.debug. And notice that we have now extension. And if we check that, it's actually got what we intended. So whenever it calls fetch, it's actually doing the fetch here and then it's setting the extension to be equal to whatever is hosted on this ngrok address. So let's go to the node server and see what we've got there. All right, so we got the connection. We can see a 200 okay. We don't see anything on the node server, but you can set up login so you can see some output here as well but it made the connection. Let's go back to the code because we wanna work out why we don't have the report link. And we see here that if debug.report is true, it's gonna create that report link. 
So when is report set to true? Well, it's set here. It's whenever the object is created and it's saying if the extension is defined, then take the properties from that and assign them to debug. Otherwise, take report true. So because we have ensured the extension is now defined, it's not actually setting report to true. So this whole segment of code is skip. So let's go back and let's actually say in here, report, and then we can set that to true or one. And let's try and save that. What's going on? What's going on with all these quotes? Oh, okay, right. I need to, let's change these to single quotes or you can escape them, whichever you prefer. Click save, we'll close down the server and launch it again. And let's go and test our payload. The only thing that has changed is what the server responds with. So I don't actually need to update any of the payload. Let's just refresh the page. And now we get back this report link. So now we want to do our prototype pollution step. We want to make sure that sanitize is disabled. And what I did here was basically, well, we first of all want to say proto. So whenever you pollute the prototype, basically every object will inherit those properties. So that's the highest level. And every object in JavaScript will inherit whatever properties are set here. So we're basically saying we want the prototype to contain a value of, and we can try and do sanitize or sanitize er. I wasn't too sure with this because we have this sanitize is set to true. We know that, where, where is it? That's the wrong page. We know that sanitize is being checked here. So it could be a case of let's disable that. So it uses this, or it could be a case of disable this or overwrite sanitizer so that even if it does go through this one, that the sanitizer won't work basically. And the reason I'm not too sure about the first one is because this is a read only property and I'm not sure that we can actually change that. Well, let's give it a go anyway. Let's try and do, we'll do sanitizer and we'll set that to zero. And let's save it. Let us restart our node server and let's go and refresh the page. All right, so we can refresh our page here and we have lost our report link. Did I take, I might've taken report out of there as well. Let's see if we check now, sanitizer, does it? Oh, not that one, I want to do lowercase. Sanitizer, okay, it still looks like it has sanitizer related stuff in here. So I'm not convinced that we overwrote what we needed to do there, but actually let's go back. Let's try it with a payload. So let's do in here image source is equal to X. And then whenever it realizes that there is no image at X, it's going to trigger an error. And then we can say, well, let's just say for a start, let's do alert one and let's close that off. Let us submit it and we get an alert. So we actually pops the alert, which is cool. Let's try that again. Let's go back to what we had and see how that works. Yeah, okay, so I did remove the report option, but let's just go back, let's take all of that out. Let's just put report back to true because I never actually tested that to show that it doesn't work by default. Back over to Chrome, we refresh the page, the exact same page, we get our report link, but we didn't get our XSS. So it is working as we expect. We need to actually pollute the prototype in order for this to work. So we'll talk about some funny things about this challenge shortly, but let's just actually, let's go back to what we had then. The sanitizer is zero we can set report to true. We don't actually need to do this because all it's doing is generating a link. We can actually just generate that link ourselves, but we might as well just to make life easy for ourselves. Let's set report to one and we'll save that. And let us restart the server. We'll go back to Chrome. And this time we actually want to get the flag. So let's grab this address that we've got our ngrok address. It's really hard to grab it from there, but we still want on error. So on error, instead of doing alert, why don't you do document location is equal to, and then we'll put in that URL. We don't just want it to visit the URL because it's already doing that as it is. We want it to give us a cookie. So we're going to do, let me put in a question mark here just so it looks a bit better. And we'll do document.cookie. Oh, need a plus sign. And that should be good. Let's try and submit that. And there we go, it redirected us. So let me go back again. I need to try and click on this very quickly. There's the report that we opened. So it's also sending that report through to the admin. Let's go and check our ngrok server. 
we don't see anything of interest here. We've just got this get request. But if you open up the web interface, you get a lot more information here. And we do that and we'll see actually we've got this request with a flag in it. So amateur CTF, sanitizer API, pretty good, but not perfect. Fun fact, I got this flag about halfway through the competition and I sent it in our team discord, but I didn't actually submit the flag. And I don't know, I just kind of assumed that somebody else would submit it. I don't know why um, nobody did submit it. So it was only after the competition ended that I realized that we didn't actually solve this challenge. It would have probably knocked us up a few placement points, but oh well. So before I talk about some of the interesting parts of this challenge and some things that we could have done a little bit differently, let's just have a quick recap. So if we go back to our source code. So yeah, we checked the code at the beginning. We realized that we need to trigger an XSS in order to get the admins cookie, which contains the flag. We quickly found that we weren't able to do that because the sanitizer is enabled. And in order to not set debug.sanitizer to false, because we actually set this sanitizer to false, in order to do that, we needed to pollute the prototype. And whenever we did the prototype pollution, or in order to do the prototype pollution, we needed to clobber the DOM in order to make sure that this window.debug.extension pointed to an object which we control so that we could put our prototype pollution payload in there. So we clobber the DOM, we pollute the prototype, and then we do XSS. And the interesting thing then about our payload is it's not actually required. So I realized that if you just take all of this out and just literally send proto with an empty object, it will work equally well. So let me close that down. Let's go and try this with a alert. So here we go, standard alert. And whenever we click submit, we still get the alert. So actually just simply send in prototype pollution with an empty object works. I'm not 100% sure why this is. I did speak with the challenge author. I think that it might be just that whenever we're sending the empty object, it's overwriting the sanitizer altogether. Although that didn't really make much sense to me because whenever we check sanitizer, oh, I was going to say maybe it, it is working as expected, but no, I just typed it wrong. So if you check sanitizer and actually have a look through this, I couldn't find any obvious differences between the sanitizer when you don't pollute the prototype compared to when you do. But obviously something's going on. If somebody wants to let me know in the comments, if you solve this challenge and you know, or you've seen this before, or you want to do a bit of troubleshooting that I'm too lazy for, then you can let me know why that worked. And yeah, I'd be interested to hear that. Another thing is we didn't actually need to send a URL in order to retrieve that JSON object. You can actually do that directly with data. So let's have a look at that as well. I will go back one page and essentially we're going to send this as our, uh, let me move this out of the way. So this is our DOM clobber in payload. Let's have a look at what we had originally so we can see them side by side. So we were using this href and it had the URL. This time we're using href, but we're specifying data and we're just giving the JSON object directly that we want to load. So we know that we can do this with an empty objects now. So I'll paste this in here. We'll do our XSS as well. So at the moment, it's not making a connection at all to our server. You don't need to be running ngrok or anything like that. And we click on submit and we still get our alerts. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. I did make a write up whenever the competition was on. So I'll leave a link to that in the description. It basically just goes through everything that I've described and shown in the video. It's probably a little bit more detailed because it's kind of hard making the video to remember everything at each time. Whenever you're making a write-up, you can kind of do things a bit more slowly and edit things whenever you get something wrong or learn something new. But yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have any questions or comments, as ever, leave them down below. Thanks.